السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم I don't have much time so I'm going to go rapidly into the topic and uh, I'll, I'll beg you to try and, and follow First, what does the Quran say about the crucifixion of Isa alayhi salam? Now, there are statements uh, scattered in, in many different passages of the Quran regarding this event. First, there is a reference in uh, Surah 3, in uh, ayat number 54 and uh, forward, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa makaru wa makar Allah. Uh, They plotted and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plotted as well. He had his own plan. Wallahu khayrul makirin. Allah is the best of planners. Uh, this refers to an incident when Isa alayhi salam uh, felt that people are rejecting him. They're going to make an attempt on his life. So he asked his disciples, who are going to be my helpers unto Allah? And they said, we are your helpers. So we are Muslims, so bear witness to that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, If qala Allahu Ya Isa inni mutawafika wa rafiwaka ilayya wa mutahiruka min alladhina kafaru. O Jesus, we are about to gather you and raise you to myself. And uh, to purify you from those who disbelieve. Now there seems to be a reference here to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking Isa alayhi salam from the earth and raising him up. Uh, to the heavens. And Allah mentions something here particularly that He is by doing this purifying Isa alayhi salam, cleansing him from those who uh, disbelieve. Now think about that for a moment and we'll come back to explain what that could mean. In uh, Surah uh, 5, Surah uh, Maida, in ayah number uh, 110, we read about Isa alayhi salam being questioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about what He preached to people. And then in uh, verse number one, 117 in that surah, Isa says, But when you took me up, when you called me back, when you recalled me, you then were the watchers, were the watcher over the people, that is over the followers of Isa alayhi salam. In other words, Isa alayhi salam says, you know, as long as I was among them, I was a witness over them. So I could, you know, you could ask me about what they were saying. But after you took me up, now you are the watcher over them. So he gives the responsibility back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here again is a reference to Isa alayhi salam being taken up. Now the term being used in both of these uh, surahs, surah 3 and surah 5, inni mutawafika or tawafaitani uh, come from an Arabic verb which uh, we use to refer to people being repaid for what they do. Wawufiyat kullu nafsim ma kasabat for example. Every soul will be repaid for what he does. Here we have a var variation of that verb tawafa which could mean settling a debt, bringing a, an agreement to a conclusion. Uh, completing a period of something. So um, some of the ancient commentators on the Quran said that what is meant here is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completing the term of Isa alayhi salam. Or it could also mean gathering up as in the sense of somebody taking uh, the reward at the end of a, of a bargain or someone taking the sum of money that is owed at the end of a, of a debt or a debt that is repaid. So they said here it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is gathering up Isa alayhi salam and raising him to himself. This is a commentary, it is an interpretation. One cannot insist on that interpretation, but nevertheless it is a viable interpretation and we will see how this fits nicely with what I have to present today. Now if Isa alayhi salam has been raised up, then uh, will he be coming again? There is no clear reference in the Qur'an that Isa alayhi salam is coming again, but there are a couple of passages which commentators have used uh, with this meaning. One is in Surah Zukhruf, in Surah 43, in ayah number 61, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِنَّهُ لَعِلْمٌ لِسَاءَ And surely he is a sign of the hour, or a knowledge of the hour. They say this refers to Isa alayhi salam, and the fact that he's a sign of the hour means that when he comes back, 
When he descends again, that will be an indication that the Day of Judgment is now approaching very close. The other passage is in Surah 4, in ayah number 159, where Allah says, وَإِمْ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لَيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ And there is none of the people of the book except that will believe in him before his death. وَيَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ يَكُونُ عَلَيْهِمْ شَهِيدًا And on the Day of Judgment, he will be a witness over them. Now this passage is not easy to translate and not easy to explain. But some commentators have said that this passage is saying that Isa alayhi salam will be a witness over each person of the book on the Day of Judgment. In other words, he'll witness against the Jews saying that he did deliver the message to them. And he'll witness to the, against the Christians saying that he did give them the right message, but they, of course, distorted it after him. So he will be a witness over them. But whose death is referred to in this ayah? There is none of the people of the book except that will believe in him before his death. Whose death? The death of each person of the book or the death of Isa alayhi salam? In the Arabic construction, this is not entirely clear, but some commentators have said that this refers to the death of the person of the book, which means that before this person dies, he will be faced with the reality of the life hereafter and will actually believe properly in Isa alayhi salam although that belief at that time will be acquired too late and will be of no use. Some other commentators have said that it means that before Isa alayhi dies, when he does return, each one of the people of the book at that time will believe in him. The Jews will now come to believe in him and the Christians will now come to believe in him correctly. In other words, they will all become Muslims. Again, as you can see from these verses, the meaning is not entirely clear, and it is an interpretation that we follow if we say this way or that way. But the most common interpretation of these verses is that they are a reference to the second coming of Isa alayhi salam. Now I want to go to a very key verse that deals with our topic at hand concerning the crucifixion. This is in Surah 4 again, and they are in verses which just precede the one I just finished discussing. Starting with verse number 157. Allah says, And as for their saying, that is the saying of the Jews, we have killed Isa, the Messiah, son of Mary. They killed him not, nor did they crucify him, but it was made so to appear to them. Now what does that all mean? The Jews are boasting that they killed Isa alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in reply that they didn't kill him. Now why would they boast that they killed him? That will uh, become clear when I discuss the biblical angle on this. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying they didn't kill him. Nor did they crucify him. What does that mean? Some have said that it means that Isa salam was not put on the cross, but that somebody else was made to appear like him, and that somebody was put on the cross. In fact, not only some, but uh, all of the ancient commentators have included this as the meaning of this passage. If you look at Tabari, or you look at Ibn Kathir, or you look at uh, some of the other Commentaries, commentators like Arazi, Al-Baydawi, and Zamakshari, they all have this as a meaning of this passage. But who was that person? And what was the sequence of events that led to this strange occurrence? On this, the commentators differ. In fact, Tabari alone offers several different interpretations that were given by early scholars even before Tabari. So it seems that in some, the Muslim commentators are not themselves sure about what exactly happened here. But there are some statements that are traced back to Ibn Ishaq, who himself traces back to Ibn Abbas, an, that a volunteer from among the disciples of Isa salam, was made to look like Jesus. He was crucified instead. And in the meantime, Isa salam, was raised up through a skylight in the house into the heavens 
and the one crucified was not Isa alayhi salam. But who exactly was this volunteer? Something vague is usually mentioned, like uh, the youngest one among his disciples. But that is not um, agreed upon by all of the commentators. In fact, some have said that there was one disciple of Jesus who plotted with the Jews to mark off Jesus, to identify him for them, so that they could know which is the person to arrest. And when this traitor, Judas, came to identify his master, he himself was changed to look like Jesus, so that when he went into the house, in the meantime Jesus was taken up into heaven, and he came back out not having found Jesus, but he himself looking like Jesus, and sounding like Jesus. So he was mistaken for Jesus, he was arrested, he was crucified, and Jesus was in heaven. So that, that in brief then is the Quranic take on this. As you can see again, there is nothing 100% certain as to what is the meaning of these verses. That shouldn't trouble us, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in his glorious book about the book itself, مِنْهُ آيَاتٌ مُحْكَمَاتٌ هُنَّ أُمُّ الْكِتَابِ وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتٌ Some of its verses are very clear. Those form the fundamentals of the book. That is the core of the book. And other verses are mutashabihat. They are unclear verses. We don't need to settle the issue of the unclear verses. Because it doesn't affect how you pray or how you fast. It doesn't affect how you practice Islam, whether or not Isa alayhi salam died, or whether he is still alive in heaven, or whether he is coming next year, or 50 years down the road. All of these make no difference. You still have to keep doing the same thing, regardless what is the answer to all of these. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his wisdom left these things vague. There is a mystery there in some, that we cannot fully penetrate. But then, let me continue. Most of the commentators have said that someone else was made to look like Isa alayhi salam. Some have said it was the one who betrayed him and tried to put him to death. He was made to look like Isa, he was put on the cross. Let me continue with the verse. The verse says, وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ اخْتَلَفُوا فِيهِ لَفِي شَكٍ مِّنْ Those who differ concerning him are in doubt concerning him. They have no knowledge concerning him. They only follow a conjecture. They did not kill him for certain. On the contrary, Allah raised him to himself. And Allah is certainly um, mighty and wise. So then in sum, given what most of the commentators have said about all of these verses that I've mentioned from the Qur'an, Isa alayhi salam was rescued by Allah, he was gathered up, he was taken up, and instead of him being crucified, someone else was made to look like him, that someone else was crucified. In the meantime, Isa alayhi salam remains alive in heaven, and there is an indication that he will be coming back before the end of all time. That much from the Qur'an. Now someone will come and argue with you and say, but wait a minute, your Qur'an was written some 600 years after Jesus. Why should we listen to your Qur'an? They say, look at our Gospels. They were written uh, 20 years, 40 years, 60 years after Jesus, on whom be peace. Let's go by the Gospels, they're closer to the source, they're more, more authentic, more original. We should say in reply, that it doesn't matter if the Qur'an came 600 years later or 6 million years later. Because the Qur'an is not the work of a man. The Qur'an is the word of Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who does not forget and who does not lie. So his witness is authoritative and it's accurate. So whether that came 600 years later or 6 million years later makes no difference. It's going to be uh, more accurate than what any human being has written. So we go by the Qur'an and not by the Gospels. But they would press their case further. And they would say, look, 
the Gospels which are closer to Isa salam, say that he was crucified. And in fact, they would add to that that uh, Roman and Jewish historians, people who did not have an axe to grind and did not have an interest in promoting Christianity, all confirmed that Isa salam, was crucified. In fact, they go one step further to say that among modern historians of Christianity, the one fact about Jesus that is not in dispute is that Jesus was crucified under Roman rule. So now they would say to you, look, if you insist that the Quran is right, that means we have to forego everything we know from history in order to believe in your Quran. In fact, this is the case that missionaries have been pressing to Muslims for some time. Recently, in my review of the writings of the missionaries, I stumbled upon something that they admit in an indirect way that actually turns around this entire argument and closes, it in, uh, closes in the argument upon their own faces. Let me explain. They are at pains to, exp to try and prove that Jesus rose from the dead. Now they need to do this because the Bible says that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, your faith is vain and everything you preach is worthless. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses number 14 and 17. Now this is what they're saying then. Since the Bible is saying, look, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the most important pillar of their belief, the cornerstone of their faith, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then the whole faith is worth nothing. So now there are pains to prove that Jesus resurrected from the dead. One of the most important proofs they offer is an argument from the origin of Christianity. They say, look, obviously Christianity began. Because it's here. It must have begun. And they're saying that Christianity would not have begun as a movement if the events concerning Jesus culminated in the crucifixion. The, the Christian faith could only have been born if Jesus rose from the dead. So we ask why? Suppose Jesus was crucified and then he was put in a tomb and then he was left there and his body just perished there. So you're telling me that's the end of Christianity? They say yes. So we ask why? They say, oh, you have to understand that Jesus was the Messiah that was promised in the Bible. And that Messiah who was promised in the Bible could not be defeated by his enemies. That Messiah who was promised in the Bible, he had to be a descendant of King David. He himself had to be a king. His task would have been to overthrow Roman rule and to institute the kingdom of God. He would have to bring the rule of God here upon earth. It would be God's Sharia, if I have to interpose our terms there. It would be, it would be God's rule that should take over, not human rule. So then, then we ask, did Jesus do this? They say no. So isn't that a problem? They say no problem. You see, he, when he comes back the second time, he will do it then. Then he will sit on a throne, then he will rule, then he will institute the kingdom of God, and he will prove himself, see, he is the Messiah. So we say, okay, we're hoping for that too. We hope that Jesus will come back and he will rule according to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So then, what is the problem? Why does he have to resurrect from the dead? Well, he has to resurrect from the dead, obviously, because he has to be alive to come back a second time. Well, that's one obvious reason. But they offer as a key reason the fact that if Jesus really was the Messiah, as described in the Bible, he could not be defeated by the enemy. He had to be victorious over the enemy. He could not be killed on the cross. And so the very point that the enemy wanted to prove is that this guy is not the Messiah. If he is the Messiah, he has to sit on a throne and rule. But we're going to hang him on a cross instead. If this guy is really the Messiah, he will wear a king's crown. But we'll give him a crown of thorns instead. 
If this guy is really the Messiah, he should wear a kingly robe. But we'll give him a king's robe just for a moment, just to mock him. Just to laugh at him, to say, you think you're going to be Messiah, sir? Here, we'll bow down to you for a moment. You want to wear a king's robe? Here is your king's robe. Only for a moment though. The next moment you'll be hanging on the cross. Crucifixion was a shameful punishment. A man was put up there on the cross. He might be nailed to the cross. He might be tied to the cross. He would be crucified naked. If you see any pictures depicting Isa alayhi salam on the cross, you will see often there is a towel just uh, hanging there in midair, covering his private region. Nothing is holding the towel, it's just the artist's imagination, he just puts a towel there, just for the sake of decency. But a man was crucified naked. He was uh, subjected to public ridicule and to shame. That was the whole point of the crucifixion, to prove that he is not the Messiah. And the way we prove that is, we crucify him. According to the Bible in the book of Deuteronomy, a man who is hanged on the cross is accursed by God. So their point was simply this, that if Jesus really was the Messiah, he couldn't be on a cross. The fact that he's on a cross proves that he is not the Messiah as described in the Bible. So what is the problem? The problem is that the New Testament Gospels show that Jesus salam, went around telling people that he is the Messiah. So if he went around claiming this, and then the enemy did this to him, that just simply proves him to be the false Messiah. It's like for you if you said that somebody is a false prophet. So Christians now have to prove that Jesus salam, really did resurrect from the dead, because then they would be able to say, oh, you guys thought you killed him. You guys thought you defeated our Messiah. But you see, you couldn't hold him down. Even death couldn't hold him down. He really is the Messiah after all. Because only the Messiah could have conquered death like this man. Look, he's alive again after you had killed him. You have to take this man seriously. So now, Christians would have to prove that Jesus salam, is resurrected from the dead in order to prove that he is the true Messiah. And their argument is that Christianity would not have been born if Jesus had not resurrected from the dead. If he just simply died on the cross, he was put in the tomb and left there forever, even his own disciples would no longer believe in him. In fact, the Gospels say that when he was arrested, they forsook him and fled. So the Christian missionaries tell us that the disciples at that moment would have concluded that Jesus is the false Messiah. All of their hopes that Jesus was the true Messiah would have been killed the very moment Jesus was put on the cross. The only way they could turn around and believe in Jesus is when Jesus actually appeared to them alive again, proving to them that he had conquered death. Now think of the logic of that now. Think of what they're admitting if you trace it to its logical conclusion. What they're saying is that if you and I were there with the disciples on the Friday evening after the crucifixion, we should think that Jesus is the false Messiah. But if we are there with the disciples on Sunday evening when they see Jesus alive again, we should think that Jesus is the true Messiah. But now, Think it through with me. If you believe in the Quran, you believe that Isa alayhi salam is the true Messiah. Is there a Muslim in this room who believes that Isa alayhi salam is not the true Messiah? No Muslim, right? How many of you believe that Isa alayhi salam is the true Messiah? Yes, of course. Al Masih Isa ibn Maryam Rasulullah. Okay. Now, if we, if the missionary comes to you and say, "Well, put aside your Quran because your Quran came 600 years later. We can't listen to that." You say, okay, well, let's suppose we put aside the Quran for the moment. Let me listen to you now. What do you have to tell me? Okay, tell me the story from the Gospels. So you go, you know, he was born there, he went there, he went there, and then suddenly they arrested him, then they crucified him. That's Friday, Good Friday. Nothing good about that Friday, but you call it Good Friday anyway. So they crucify him on that Friday. So there I am on a Friday evening. What should I conclude now? He's a false messiah. He says, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm getting to the resurrection part. Say, so, okay, let's go to the resurrection part. If you allow them to read the four Gospels, and I don't have time now to elaborate, because Sheikh Abdul Hakim is already here, and his talk is going to come up now in uh, two seconds flat. But uh, if you allow them to read for you from the four Gospels, 
that section dealing with the resurrection is always the last chapter. The last chapter of each gospel, except the Gospel of John, which has two chapters on this. And the only reason for that is that somebody came along later on and added a second chapter into the gospel according to John. So it's easy for you to remember. If any missionary comes to talk to you, ask them, can you read me the last chapter of each gospel? You think you can remember that? Yes, <laughs> just read me the last chapter of each gospel. Not one gospel only, but all the four gospels. Jazakum Allah khairan. Being very generous with me, ma'am. Shukla. Jazakum Allah khairan. All right. So, not just one gospel, but all of the four gospels. And then what you do is you take notes. Now, you may not remember that I said that the gospel according to John has two chapters on this. But when you get to the last chapter of John, if that's where they got to, you will know that there's something before it. So you'll say, oh, well, wait a minute, just back up one chapter, please, so we get the full context here. He'll go back one chapter for you. Now you take your notes. Write down questions and see what is the answer to these questions. For example, four Gospels, they tell you that the female disciples of Isa Alayhi Salaam went to the tomb on the Sunday morning. So who were the women that went? At what time of day did they go? For what reason did they go to visit the tomb? How did they find the tomb? In other words, in what condition was the tomb? Was it open? Was it closed? Whom did they meet there? What message did this person or persons or angel or angels give to the women? What did the women do after getting this instruction? Whom did they go and tell? Did they remain silent and told nobody, as Mark says? Or did they run and tell the disciples, as Matthew says? You will find that to all of these questions, there are two, three, sometimes four different answers in the Gospels. The Gospels contradict each other regarding to whom Jesus appeared, when he appeared, in what form, in what manner, how did they see him, and so on. And the reason for these contradictions is that in the earliest Gospel, there was no proof or evidence that Jesus resurrected from the dead. But as the later Gospels come along, they improve upon the story to introduce evidence to show that Jesus resurrected from the dead. So then, if you were to take the four Gospels in a chronological sequence, Mark is the earliest of the four Gospels to be written, although it appears second in every New Testament today. But Mark is the first, according to the conclusions of the generality of, Muslim, of uh, Christian <laughs> biblical scholars. Mark first, John last. If you look at the story, the way it is told in Mark, and then you see how it is told in Matthew and Luke, and then how it is told in John, you will see that in Mark you have very little evidence that Jesus resurrected from the dead. But in John, lots of evidence. You will see that in Mark, it is not even certain that Jesus died. But in John, it is definite. You know, in John, they have it that you know, somebody came and take, took a spear and thrust it into his side, and immediately blood and water gushed out of there. You have to make sure this man is really dead. Because if he wasn't dead, he didn't resurrect from the dead, true? <laughs> so you have to make sure that he's dead. So the last of the Gospels, make sure of that. Alright, you ask, what about the witnesses? How do we know that this was really Jesus up there? Were there eyewitnesses who gave the information for the Gospels? According to Mark, the first Gospel, the women disciples, who were the only ones around because, you know, the males had forsaken him and fled. The women disciples were looking at this from afar. That's the first Gospel. In the last one, it says that not only the women disciples, but his own mother was there at the foot of the cross. I remember all the male disciples had forsaken him and fled. But in this fourth gospel, one of the disciples, John, who was said to be the author of this gospel, he is there at the foot of the cross also. So they can be sure, yeah, the man up there is really Jesus. So if Muslims come now and say, well, wait a minute, ma qataluhu wa ma salabuhu wa lakin shubbihalahum, what are you talking about? We have eyewitnesses who were there at the foot of the cross. But then, if you tell them to look at the chronological sequence of how these Gospels were written, and you look at the first Gospel, where were the disciples? Nobody knows. They forsook him and fled. Who was at the foot of the cross? Nobody, because his women disciples were looking from afar. Right? Go back to that earlier record and see what happens there. All right, very quickly to wrap it up now. In the first gospel, what is the evidence that Jesus had resurrected from the dead? It says that on the Sunday morning, 
when the women disciples went to look at the tomb, they found that the tomb was already opened. And a young man in white clothing said to them, Do not be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's not here. Look at the place where they had laid him. He is risen. But go and tell his disciples that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will meet him, as he told you. And the women disciples then, what did they do? According to the Gospel according of Mark, in chapter 16, verse number 8, the women disciples fled from the tomb. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's the end of the gospel there. In all the ancient manuscripts you can find of this gospel, that's the last of it. It's done. It makes you wonder, how did this gospel even came to be written? If the women said nothing to anybody because they were afraid, how did Mark even find this out to write it in his gospel? <laughs> But if you ask the more serious question, what is the evidence here that Jesus resurrected from the dead? There's no evidence. What you have is an empty tomb, a missing body. And the young man saying that Jesus had risen. A young man in white clothes. Now some would want to press and say, well, you know, that's an angel. But... You know, that's an assumption, right? To assume that it's an angel. The gospel specifically says it's a young man in white clothes. I mean, I'm a young man and sometimes I do wear white clothes. <laughs> so there, there is no uh, solid evidence there in the earliest gospel that Jesus appeared to his disciples alive so they can see that he's really alive and, and that he conquered death. But the later gospels, as I say, try to improve upon that information. In fact, they give more evidence. They say that Jesus appeared on this occasion or on that occasion. And you can see the later the Gospels, the more information you have, the more evidence you have, the more occasions he appears, the more people he appears to, and the more clarity in the appearances, so that they're really sure that they see Jesus. But then let's uh, take it step by step. Well, not in every step, because I have to watch my time. I have to wrap this up very quickly. A key problem apart from the contradictions, is that even if you just take the stories as they are and you try to give them a sympathetic hearing and say, okay, let, let, let's see what your eyewitness evidence is saying here. Okay, you have a man in court saying, I did see Jesus. Okay, what does he have to say? How did he recognize Jesus? Now you would expect that the disciples of Jesus who had uh, given up all their property, given up their family and everything, they came and they walked and lived with Jesus for the last three years, preaching with him and so on, uh, they would be able to recognize Jesus as soon as they see him. They see my brother uh, Ali and they say, you know, my friend, you know, when I saw him at the, uh, uh, when I came uh, last night and I saw him, you know, we, immediately we recognized each other, although we hadn't seen each other for two years, Achi. True? Yeah, so there's no difficulty there. I don't have to say, but wait a minute, let me see your passport for a minute. Are you the same? Huh? You know. <laughs> the Gospels show that when it is claimed that Jesus appeared to his disciples, invariably they at first do not recognize him. And when they do recognize him, it is not from his face or his voice. It is from some other feature. For example, on one occasion, according to the Gospel uh, of um, Matthew, uh, Jesus appeared to his disciples on the mountain top. Remember the young man in white clothes said to the women, go and tell my disciples to go to Galilee, there they will see me. So apparently the disciples now did go to Galilee. See, Mark promised it and now Matthew is delivering it. Okay? So the disciples do go to Galilee and they see him and they worshipped him, but they doubted. Matthew chapter 28 verse 17 says, they worshipped him, but they doubted. And you want to know, what does it mean they doubted? Some of the translators tried to turn the words away from the obvious meaning and camouflage the problem here by saying some doubted. That means they can still say some of the disciples really believed and knew it was Jesus, but some others doubted. But the Greek really says they doubted. What do you mean they doubted? Doubted what? One Bible translation says, some were not sure it really was Jesus. That's the living Bible. 
Some were not sure it really was Jesus. What do you mean they were not sure it really was Jesus? So why the were they even worshipping? See, they see something, they're not sure is it Jesus or not. So it could be God, could be not. And they're still worshipping. Why are they worshipping? Something that they don't even know. So you see there's a problem here. But the key point is, if they saw him and they were not sure, how could they come stand in a court of law and give testimony and say, yeah, I saw Jesus, he resurrected from the dead. They can't. So that evidence is not valid. Alright, we go to the Gospel according to Luke. It says that two of the disciples of Jesus were walking along on a country road. And then Jesus came along and started walking along with them. And joined in their conversation. Now you have to think about it. If two persons are walking along on a country road, and some stranger comes up to them and joins in their conversation, the first thing they're going to do is to look at this person to see who, who is this stranger here that comes along and starts to join in our conversation. This is not like you're walking along in downtown Oslo, and uh, you know, you, crowds of people are flocking around you in, in the shopping district, and you don't care who is there because you know there's always somebody there. You might hold your pockets a little bit to make sure that you, you keep everything you have, but uh, you, you don't care who is really there. So you would expect these guys would look at Jesus to find out uh, who is, is he. But it says that they mistook him for a stranger. And they said to him, are you the only stranger in these parts who do, did not know what happened over the last little while? And it says that eventually when they sat down and broke bread, that is when they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. And then they said to each other, weren't our hearts burning when he talked to us on the country road? So it looks like uh, based on a heart burn, they were convinced that this was Jesus that they saw. According to the Gospel of John, Jesus on one occasion, that same Sunday evening, he appeared to his disciples when they were sitting around at a banquet table. But one of the disciples was not there on that occasion. The disciple named Thomas. And when they, the rest of them told Thomas, you know, Jesus was here. Thomas said, unless I put my finger in the nail wound and put my hand in the side wound, I'm not going to believe. Now let me ask you, why would Thomas say something so curious as this? Why didn't he just simply say, Un unless I see him myself, I won't believe him? Because all Thomas really needs to do is to see him, right? Does he need to see a nail wound or, or a side wound? No. He just has to see him and he says, oh Jesus! It's like, you really, Jesus, I love you. But but he says, unless I put my finger in the nail wound, and I put my hand in the side wound, I'm not going to believe. So what does he want to check for? He wants to check to make sure that this is really a crucified man. And then eventually Jesus does come back when he's there, and Jesus says, come Thomas, put your finger here. Come Thomas, put your hand here. And Thomas obviously comes forward and does it, and he says, my Lord and my God. So... All you can say here is that whatever appeared to the disciples is a crucified man, well enough, but who does not look like Jesus and does not sound like Jesus. On one occasion, you see the Gospel of John, remember that's the last of the four to be written, right? The Gospel of John is at pains to try and make you convinced that yeah, Jesus appeared to them and they were sure they saw Jesus and everything is fine. But even when it tells you that, you can see, if, I mean, some of you might be speaking English as a second language, but when I read, you know, when I read what John wrote, you know, it, just, uh, it, it hits me like a ton of bricks. I see there's a major problem there. John says that on one occasion, Jesus uh, cooked a breakfast for his disciples. And when they came and they sat there around him to eat that breakfast, it says, none of them dared to ask him who he was, because they were sure it is the Lord. What do you mean nobody dared to ask him who he was because they were sure it was the Lord? You really mean they wanted to ask him, but they didn't dare to ask. You really mean they weren't sure. And that is a problem. It's an ongoing problem that is there. So much so that Christian scholars recognize that this is a problem. So then in sum, let me retrace my steps then very quickly. We looked at the Quranic verses. The Quranic verses do not solve the mystery about the end of Jesus' life. 
The Quranic verses gives us some hints. It gives us some terms which I would include under the mutashabihat. Something there happened to Isa alayhi which is not entirely clear. But Muslim commentators putting all the verses together and hadith dealing with the issue say generally that Isa alayhi was not crucified. An attempt was made on his life. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered him and raised him up into heaven. And instead, someone was made to look like Jesus. Possibly this was the very man who came to arrest Jesus, who betrayed him to the enemy, was made to look like Jesus, and he was crucified instead. In the meantime, Jesus salam, remains alive, and before the day of judgment, Isa salam, will be made to descend again, and he will rule according to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Christians will come to say to you, man, you guys have really got it wrong. You believe in a book that came 600 years after Jesus. We can't believe in that book. It is an established fact of history that Jesus was crucified. So we say, all right, well, let's think about that for a moment. If you say Jesus was crucified, what does that prove? You say it proves that he was the false Messiah. But you say you can also prove he was the true Messiah by proving that he resurrected from the dead. So you say, okay, wise guy, prove it to me now. So you just convince me that he was crucified. That you say is the accepted fact of history. Okay, suppose I put my Quran aside. Suppose I pretend for a, Muslim, for a moment that I'm not a Muslim. What would I conclude? That Jesus was crucified. What does that imply? False Messiah. Okay, now somebody has to prove to me that he resurrected from the dead. Prove it to me. Now he brings you the four Gospels. Are these good proofs? No. Because we see the story changing before our very eyes from Mark to Matthew and Luke and then finally to John. We see no good evidence over here, lots of evidence over here. We see the evidence conflicting with each other over time. If you make your notes carefully, how many people went to the tomb, when they went, who went, whom did they see, in what condition did they find the tomb, uh, what did the person tell them, whether it was a man or two men or an angel or two angels, what message did they get, what did they do with that message, whom did they tell, did they even tell anyone? All of that you will find contradictory answers for among the four Gospels. And just because the Gospel writers were trying to improve the story along the way as they went. Moreover, even if you take the stories as they are and you try to give them a sympathetic hearing, you see that this, the evidence is not convincing. Somebody says, you know, my heart was burning on the country road, so I'm sure that was Jesus. Or somebody says, well, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I made sure he had those crucifixion wounds. This was definitely a crucified man. Well, that could have been any crucified man, right? A crucified man doesn't mean he's necessarily dead. It takes a while for a man to be killed on a cross. And according to the Gospels, Jesus salam, was only there for about three hours on the cross. A man might be there for three days and still um, finally, uh, and, and then eventually expire after three days. So then, if a man was taken down from the cross early enough, he would still be alive, and if they saw a man who had the wounds of crucifixion, that does not mean that they saw Isa alayhi salam, especially if the man didn't look like Isa alayhi salam and didn't sound like Isa alayhi salam. So finally then, to put it in a nutshell, if we were to believe in the Quran, we believe in Isa alayhi salam. We believe he is the true Messiah, because this is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that couldn't lie. Whether it comes six hundred years later or six million years later, makes no difference to us. That is the book of Allah, we believe in Isa alayhi salam on the credibility of this book itself. But if they say, leave the Quran aside for a moment and go with our Gospels, we would come to the crucifixion, that's easy enough to believe that a man was crucified. We say, okay, so he was crucified. Okay, I believe that with you. So what does that mean? He's the false Messiah. You want to prove to me that he's the true Messiah? Go ahead and prove that he was resurrected from the dead. Now the evidence you give me is not good enough. I cannot conclude that with you. Therefore, I must remain on the first conclusion that he is the false Messiah. So if I believe in the Quran, he's the true Messiah. If I believe in your Bible, as much as a reasonable person could believe, he's the false Messiah. He would say to you, well, wait a minute. You believed in the Bible only in so far as proving that he was crucified. Why not believe in the Bible some more in believing that he was resurrected from the dead? And you should say, well, when the Bible says that he was crucified, that's not difficult for a person to believe. If you tell me a man was executed, I have no difficulty believing that. I'm not going to ask you, what did you eat for breakfast? What kind of drugs are you on? Because if you tell me a man was executed, that's easy enough to believe. 
But if you tell me, you know the guy who was executed in Texas last uh, Monday on the electric chair? You saw him rising and uh, you know, dancing around and finally expiring on television? You know that guy, he's still alive. I just saw him this morning. He will say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, my friend. What kind of cereal do you eat for breakfast? You're high on something, man. Prove to me, where do you read this stuff? Is it in the National Enquirer? Or where is it? Give me good evidence. So now you're demanding evidence. So a reasonable person then, if you believe in the Quran, you believe that Isa alayhi salam is true, if they say, no, we can't listen to your Quran, listen to our Gospels, we would have to conclude that Isa alayhi salam is the false Messiah. So then, the only way that a reasonable person could believe in Isa alayhi salam today is by believing in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorious Quran. In fact, I just stumbled upon this as I was reviewing the arguments from the Christian missionaries themselves. They didn't say directly that Isa alayhi salam, that there is this problem with Isa alayhi salam and the crucifixion, but by what they have said in their trying to prove that he resurrected from the dead, they actually let the cat out of the bag and they exposed to me a major problem regarding the crucifixion. And that is what I shared with you. I want all Muslims to know this because people come knocking on your doors telling you not to believe in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want you to have the ready answer for that. I hope that I've helped you in some way with that. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the strength, the tawfiq and the discipline to always stand up and preach his word far and wide and to stand up for the truth and for justice. Wa akhiru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Sorry I took up so much of your time. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah.